Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live via Skype in Holland with James Jacob Prash. Uh, Jacob, I'm a little familiar with Jews for Jesus, but a lot of people have questions about the organization. Um, what is your commentary on Jews for Jesus and the current state of that organization? To understand the current state, we have to draw a distinction between what the organization has become and what it began as. Jews for Jesus is something that emerged from the revival among hippies in the late 1960s, early 1970s. In one summer alone, 30,000 Jewish hippies got saved in California. In one summer alone, uh, some people remember the, the hit single by a Jewish professing believer in Jesus, Norman Greenbaum, Spirit in the Sky. Uh, goes back to that particular era, only it began more on the East Coast. Morris Rosen was an interesting character. Morris Rosen was somebody who in uh, Yiddish would be called the quintessential nebbish. He was like almost a poor soul kind of guy, except he had an underlying, very savvy way of reading people and of, of, of thinking strategically that would not come across at first sight. You'd have to get to know him to realize he had a highly analytical mind, that he had insight into people, and that he was somebody who <coughs> could think and plan very strategically. Moore Chosen was originally from Denver, Colorado area. His parents were not believers, um, neither one of them. And he faced a certain amount of family rejection when he did become a believer. His actual name had been Martin. His Hebrew name had been Moish. He found some sponsorship from a church that helped him get a theological education. But he didn't go into ministry initially. He married a nice woman named Seal, and they eventually had two daughters. But Moish was the kind of guy, again, a nebbish. He had a hard time holding down any kind of a steady job. It just didn't work out for him. Until, of all things, he began selling burial plots in a cemetery. And he took on a staff of seminarians, of evangelical seminarians, thinking they would be more compassionate to people who had been bereaved, and began using them as a sales staff. And it worked. He had this kind of ability that was a combination of business ability, but also an ability to see the potential in people. That's the best way I could describe him. But he is not somebody who would impress you at first glance or at first meeting. You'd have to get to know him a bit to realize how much depth he had and how clever he actually was both humanly speaking, but also in his ability to adopt his business abilities as he acquired them, and they were acquired business abilities, they were not inherent or innate, adopting them in the Lord's service. He had been, at a somewhat later point, recruited by a ministry that had originally been called the American Board of Mission to the Jews founded by a famous rabbi who got saved, Rabbi um, Leopold Cohen. This was in New York at this time when the revivals happened among the hippies. Walsh was initially, initially repulsed by the hippie culture and all that went with it. But he believed the Lord had convicted him about his attitude towards hippies. It was something similar to what happened with Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith opened up his heart and took these hippies under his wings and began the Calvary Chapel movement. Well, Morse Rosen did a sort of a Messianic Jewish version of that, uh, only it was not called Messianic too popularly at the time. 
there were people who supported the American border mission to the Jews who didn't agree with him because they didn't like hippies either. And it led to some tensions. There were conflicts between the American Board of Mission to the Jews, at that time directed by a wonderful man of God, uh, Dr. Fuchs and Marsh Rosen. It was not so much theological or doctrinal, but certainly in terms of evangelistic strategy. Marsh Rosen became very angry and disturbed when a member of the religious Jewish community, Jewish religious community, told him that most Jews don't even know that there are such things as evangelists and missionary to, missionaries to Jews, and that there are Jews who believe in Jesus. This bothered him. He sees these hippies who are galvanized to, to protest the war in Vietnam and protest on behalf of civil rights and all these things, and he capitalizes on this, and he takes these Jewish hippies from the East Coast out west to San Francisco, eventually splitting from the American Board of Mission to the Jews, which later became known as Chosen People Ministries, today directed by one of the founding members of Jews for Jesus, Dr. Mitch Glazer, dear friend and brother. In any event, there were hippies living on a boat in San Francisco Bay, like Jan Moskowitz and, and uh, Mitch Glazer and some others, and, and, and a sister now lives in Israel, I won't mention her name for obvious reasons. And he gets these hippies and they begin going out, giving out these kinds of tracts called broadsides that could be read in 90 seconds. They were there to catch people's eye. And within three years, Morse Rosen made it known coast to coast in the United States. Morse Rosen and Jews to Jesus, within three years, made it known to the Jewish community and to the church that there was a growing contingent of Jewish people, especially Jewish young people, who believed Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And they held these beliefs based on their interpretations of the Hebrew Scriptures. As an evangelistic agency, a lot of people were never saved through Jews for Jesus. Uh, some were both Jew and non-Jew. People were saved, but not large numbers. What was effective about Jews to Jesus is what they called lifting up the banner of Yeshua, making his messiahship an issue in the Jewish community in a confrontational, high-profile way. Enter a young woman from Brooklyn, East New York in Brooklyn, Sue Perlman, who had a media background. She leaves everything they were virtually penniless, goes to California, and begins applying her media skills in Jewish evangelism. Again, at this point, they were a hippie tribe. They didn't have a lot of money, they didn't really know what they were doing, but Moshe Rosen had a kind of a vision from the Lord, I suppose we would put it that way. And in the early years, God did bless it and use it. It, it sparked high-profile evangelism, among others. They did things like teach the church how to evangelize Jews. Others did that, but Jews to Jesus became known for doing it. They also had something called the Department of Mobile Evangelism. They had music groups like the Liberated Wailing Wall. And the Jewish believer, who was a composer, Stuart Dowerman, composing music that's widely sung among evangelical Christians around the world to this day. Um, and the trees of the field will clap their hands, the trees of the field will, great and wonderful are thy wondrous deeds. The music was great, the blessing of God was there, but they never took themselves seriously. They only took the Lord and the gospel seriously. They never took themselves seriously begins to change. It begins to change in the 1970s, towards the late 70s, the hippie era is now over. And they had something called an avodah. They effectively closed down their branches around the country and they all had a convocation 
in San Francisco to reorganize the ministry along different lines. They did that. And some people would say that was a change for the better. Others would say it was a change for the worse. Others still would say it was a change for both the better and for the worse. One of the things that began to happen was many of the charter members began to leave on bad terms, having serious arguments. When there had been a tribe of hippies, it was much more informal. Once it became a slick organization, personality conflicts began to emerge. And a lot of people left the ministry. They had an unbelievable turnover rate, including among many of the founding members. I myself was there and saw some of this going on. I'd been what they later called a co-laborer, a volunteer, and then a, a co-laborer. I knew many of the, I knew virtually all of the founding members. I knew more Rosen. And I saw this happening, but it was of no interest to me to get involved in their internal affairs. I was simply interested in evangelizing Jewish people. Now, in my own life, God used them. I had a born-again experience in February of 1972 through a cult called the Children of God. Then I became involved in another depraved organization called the Forever Family. These Jesus freak organizations that became cults. Jews for Jesus were like Calvary Chapel. They were different. They combined the zeal and the radicalism of the Jesus freaks, that is the hippies who got saved, with the stability of the established church. And it was good. Those groups that tended to become isolated tended to become cults or cultic like Bible Speaks, like Jesus People USA, certainly the Forever Family, later called the Church of Bible Understanding, and quintessentially the Children of God with Mo Berg. Jews for Jesus was not like that because they were sort of Baptists, and they never severed their relationship with the established churches, even though they were something different. Having said that, with the Avodah, things begin to change. One of the complaints that people who were in Jews for Jesus had was this. It became a machine. It was no longer really spiritual or, or organic. It was now a machine where it was how many tracks, how many broadsides can you give out at the Thanksgiving Day Parade? And, and, and they would count all the broadsides and how many they gave out in this kind of... And you only spend three minutes talking to somebody who wants to engage you when you give them a broadside. If they don't give you their name and address, move on to the next one. Now, that's fine for the Thanksgiving Day Parade or commuter rush hour in Grand Central Station or something like this. But there are other times and places where evangelism could have been and should have been more dialogue-oriented and spending time with people, uh, not just making an appointment to call them and see them at some future point. In the opinion of many people, this impeded the evangelistic ability of Jews to Jesus to actually see people saved, even though their methodology was very much market-driven long before Rick Warren got his ideas from Peter Drucker. Marshall Rosen was way ahead of those guys using marketing psychology in promoting the idea that Jesus is the Messiah. He was way ahead of what Rick Warren and Peter Drucker came way ahead of those guys. Uh, with the exception of Robert Schuller, I don't know anyone who was as progressive as Marsh Rosen was then. Now, I'm not saying that he went off doctrinally the way... Um, Rick Warren did. He didn't. Marsh Rosen never went off doctrinally. But it became a machine in the opinion of many people who left it and left it on sad terms. It also became a complaint that donor relations were no longer there to fund the evangelism, but the evangelism was there to drive the donor relations. Whether that's true or not, I don't want to make the judgment. I'm just saying there was that thought that some people had and still have. There was also other things I prefer not to talk about, but 
eventually, there was a guy who I knew who was one of the family members, a U.S. Marine who was injured in friendly fire in Vietnam called Baruch Goldstein, fell away from the Lord. He went into serious immorality. I did not agree with what he did, but he put out an expose publicly about the inner workings of Jews for Jesus and Moshe Rosen. Now, I thought it was detrimental to the cause of Jewish evangelism, and given his own moral issues, I thought it was rather inappropriate, if not hypocritical, for him to be the one to do it. But the things he said were essentially true. Nonetheless, I didn't say anything. After Marsh Rosen retired, the person who replaced him had a marital crisis and his wife left him. He did not want the divorce. It was his wife who wanted the divorce. He did not. I don't think it's fair to blame him for what happened, at least to the extent he did not want to split with his wife. And there was a question, even a division within the ministry, should they have an executive director, the person who replaced Marsh Rosen when Marsh retired, yet remained on the board, who was divorced. This became another problem, but I kept my mouth shut. There were other things I began to have problems with. At the same time, other people were having problems, but I never went public with them. In order to expand their donor base and bring as many people on board in support of them, who agreed with evangelizing Jews, a lot of compromises were made. One of which that I objected to and wrote more shows in, and he wrote me back, it was cordial, was the change in their doctrinal position from premillennialism, even though they themselves, and certainly the leadership, were premillennial. In Jewish evangelism, the two biggest obstacles or common objections you're going to face in evangelizing Jewish people are one, the history of Christian anti-Semitism, and the other is, if Jesus was the Messiah, why didn't he bring in worldwide peace? Now, premillennialism can answer that. I refer you to the background of our teachings, one Messiah, two comings, Hamashiach ben Yosef and Hamashiach ben David, Messiah, son of Joseph, Messiah, son of David. In his first coming, a suffering servant. In his second coming, a conquering king. Premillennialism can deal with that problem. Why didn't he bring in worldwide peace? But if you abandon premillennialism, you abandon your apologetic. So it became a question, are you putting donor relations ahead of messianic apologetics? In effect, giving a priority over evangelism, your raison d'etre. That really bothered me but I made no criticisms publicly. Again, I didn't want to hurt the cause of Jew, Jewish evangelism, and secondly, I was personally indebted to Jews to Jesus and to more chosen. They at one point helped me a bit getting through seminary financially, and in England, and at the earlier stages of my Christian life, I stabilized in my faith primarily through Jews for Jesus, having been in these crazy cultic groups, it was through Jews for Jesus that I stabilized. They, at that early point in their history, had both the zeal and the drive and the radicalism of the hippies, and they, they didn't say that of the drug culture and so forth as I was, but they had a stability about them. And I'd have to thank the Lord and I credit Marsh for that. I'm not saying... There were not things to which I had been and remain personally indebted to that ministry, at least based on what it was. And to more shows in himself, who's now gone to be with the Lord. And another episode concerned the Lausanne consultation on Jewish evangelism. I've been unhappy with that organization because it was part of a broader organization called Lausanne Consultation on World Evangelism that was becoming increasingly, increasingly ecumenical. That was one problem. The other problem was they had a featured speaker at one of their conferences, a person who I personally liked, who was on the board of an organization that signed an agreement not to evangelize Jews, 
as long as they could transport them from Russia to Israel. Well, the former Soviet Union to Israel. Now, the Laosan consultation put out a statement that they wanted the church to see and believe and the Jewish community to see and believe. And it said, not evangelizing Jews, withholding the gospel from Jews is a form of anti-Semitism. I agreed. But then they bring in a speaker who's on the board of an organization who does the very thing they said was anti-Semitic. Now, Susan Perlman, Marsh Rosen's right-hand woman, was on the board of this Laosan consultation on Jewish evangelism. For the sake of theocratic politics, once again, politics prevailed over evangelism. My question was, if you don't take your own statements and press releases seriously, why should the church or the Jewish community take them seriously? And I withdrew from the organization. I saw it was more about the theocratic politics of Jewish evangelism than it was about Jewish evangelism. Fast forward a bit. I had these problems, but I never uttered a syllable in public. Others did. Former members of the Jews for Jesus staff did. Baruch Goldstein did. But I never did. Never wanted to. I was only interested in seeing Jews saved, and if they were evangelizing Jews, that was fine with me, even though there were things I privately and personally disagreed with. I was in debt to Marsh and to the ministry due to the help and benefit I derived from it in my earlier years as a believer at the time of the earlier years of Jews for Jesus. But more recently, something terrible happened. Something absolutely tragic and disgraceful. Going back to the early years of Jews for Jesus, Morse Rosen in the Jews for Jesus newsletter published an article with a statement that was akin to something Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King had said concerning Zionism. Morse said that anti-Zionism is in effect nothing more than the current expression of anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism is the current expression of anti-Semitism. That was the official position of Jews to Jesus, of Marsh Rosen. That's what they published, and I agreed with it. Although there are some people who would say they're anti-Zionist and don't hate Jews, if you look at the overall thrust and ethos of anti-Zionists, they are anti-Semitic. But something happened. In England, we had horrific scandals led by someone called Stephen Sizer. Stephen Sizer is an Anglican vicar who went on the war path against Christian Zionists, Christian supporters of Israel, and against Israel. To the point where he went to Iran, when Iran was persecuting Christians, hanging Christian pastors, threatening to wipe Israel off the map, and embrace on television these Iranian officials of this regime that was persecuting Christians. They were his friends and brothers as long as they hated Israel. And he claimed to be an evangelical. He was the vicar of an evangelical parish in the Anglican diocese of Guildford, near where I live in England. <coughs> when I'm in England. Well, Mr. Sizer got himself in all kinds of trouble. At one point, he agreed to debate me on television, but then backed down. And he said that I love Israel more than I love Jesus Christ, which is a complete lie. I myself have opposed those who support Zionism but refuse to evangelize Jews. What he said was absolutely slanderous and defamatory. But that was very minor compared to his other antics. He was an organizer of a conference called Christ at the Check Post, held in Bethlehem in league with something called the Seville Movement, led by an anti-Zionist Anglican, Naim Atik, an Arab, nominal Christian, someone called Dr. Alex Awad and his brother, who I debated on television, 
in the UK. I debated Alex Awad. And also someone called Salim Munyaner, who had an organization called, or has an organization called Musal Hala. These conferences were very controversial. Salim Munyaner had made statements that it would be impossible for most people to read or listen to and not conclude that he was an apologist for Islamic terror. He says nothing about the persecution of Arab believers, even in the West Bank or in Gaza by Hamas. Nothing. Everything is against Israel. He is associated or he is a member of the staff of Bethlehem Bible College. He runs this Musal Hala organization, and he is a bedfellow with both Susan Perlman and Richard Harvey, the first UK director of Jews for Jesus, who remains on their council. This was a problem. Now, there was a dispute in Israel, should local Israeli believers attend this conference and speak at it? Some said, at least we will get the opportunity to put in our perspective and show there are two sides to the coin. There's a rival argument to the so-called Christian anti-Zionism being propagated by Salim Munyaner, by Gary Berg, Naeem Atik, and others, and Stephen Sizer. Others said it is so anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and even anti-Semitic that there's no point in having any participation in it, even if they invite somebody who's an Israeli to, believer to speak at it. There are credible points on both sides of the argument. The problem is the association with Salim Munyaner after he made these statements that it would be impossible for most people to see as anything other than him speaking as an apologist for Islamic terror and the further antics of Richard Harvey and Susan Perlman with Stephen Sizer. Stephen Sizer mentioned the conspiracy theorists about Jews did this and Jews did that concerning September 11th. What he was saying got into the secular press in Britain, but was certainly in the Jewish press. The Jewish Chronicle, the Jewish Telegraph, the Jewish community knew all about Stephen Sizer. He was visibly seen by them as not just an anti-Zionist, but an anti-Semite. But not only by him. The Church of England, not a conservative evangelical organ by any stretch of the imagination. A theologically, by and large, liberal and ecumenical one that has compromised on same-sex marriage, homosexual ordination, etc. These are not conservative evangelicals silenced Stephen Sizer and told him not to speak about Israel or the Middle East anymore because of the nature of his remarks. The conference of Christians and Jews were up in arms about the things he was saying. They were seen as anti-Semitic even by the secular press, not just by the Jewish community, and not just by pro-Israel evangelical Christians. He violated the terms, and then he was banned from preaching, period. The Church of England banned Stephen Sizer from preaching until his retirement. They wouldn't let this Anglican clergyman even preach about any subject, not even in his own pulpit. That's how bad he was. That didn't matter to Jews for Jesus. Richard Harvey had already placed hyper-charismatic extremists who were proponents of the Toronto experience and who were ultra-replacement theology such as Roger Foster and Gerald Coates on the Council of Reference of Jews for Jesus, including annihilationism. Roger Foster being an annihilationist, there's no eternal hell. Now again, this is not the conduct of a conservative evangelical organization. Those are not the kinds of people conservative evangelicals would normally want on their Council of Reference. But Richard Harvey was more concerned again with theocratic politics and academic parlance up at a place called All Nations Bible College than he was about doctrine, or than he was even about our witness and testimony to the Jewish community. While the Church of England, while the Conference of Christians and Jews were up in arms about Sizer, even banning him from preaching at, at, at 
the conclusion of the matter, not once, but not twice, when all this was going on, not once, but twice, Richard Harvey went to Stephen Sizer's church as an invited guest to speak with lots of photo ops, handshaking, and back slapping. To the Jewish community, this says Jews for Jesus are partners in anti-Semitism. That's what it says to the Jewish community. Again, Spicer's statements and actions were widely reported in the secular press and in the Jewish Telegraph, the Jewish Chronicle, on the internet, etc. Widely reported. They all knew. That didn't matter to Jews for Jesus, and it didn't matter to Richard Harvey. He did it not once, but twice. The Church of England bans the guy from speaking. Stephen Sizer's messianic Jewish lapdog. And so was Susan Perlman. She spoke there. You cannot have a witness to the Jewish people unless you are a witness. You cannot have a testimony to the Jewish people when you are visibly in bed with anti-Semites, shaking hands, having photo ops and back slapping for the sake of fundraising. This was a shame and a disgrace. What Richard Harvey did was a shame and a disgrace and an indictment of his ministry. He shouldn't be in the ministry to Jewish people. And it's an indictment of Susan Perlman and of Jews for Jesus and of their leadership and board for allowing this outrage. I agree we should not put political criteria on evangelism. But we're talking about anti-Semitism. Salim Mounyaner at a time when my son was in a frontline combat brigade in the IDF. And he's making these statements. Susan Perlman and Richard Harvey are in bed with him. This was an offense to many believers in Israel and an offense to many Christians who support Israel in the UK. But what about the Arab believers who are persecuted in Gaza, in the West Bank, but certainly in Gaza and in Lebanon, and the believers being persecuted in Iran? No problem for Stephen Sizer, but good old photo ops, fundraising, and backslapping. Sue Perlman and Richard Harvey. What they did is nothing short of a shame and a disgrace. Jews for Jesus is not the same ministry. I would like to believe, I would like to believe that if Marsh Rosen had still been with us, that would not have been allowed to happen. He published the statement in their newsletter that anti-Zionism is the current expression of anti-Semitism. I'd like to believe, had Marsh still been here, it wouldn't have happened. But Marsh is now with the Lord, and it did happen. David Brickner, sadly, let it happen. The Board of Jews for Jesus, let it happen. And Richard Harvey and Susan Perlman did it. It bothers me to say this. I used to pray for that organization every day. I supported it financially. It once helped me financially when I was in seminary. God used it in my life. I always kept my mouth closed about the things I disagreed with, even when I was convinced they were wrong. But when you torpedo your testimony to the Jewish community, when you torpedo your witness to the Jewish community, when you're in bed with it, people who can only be seen by the Jewish community as anti-Semites and apologists for radical Islamic terror, people who turn their back on the persecuted church in Islamic countries like Stephen Sizer and they're his brothers and his friends simply because they hate Israel. And Jews for Jesus pandered to him to take up a collection? Jews for Jesus still has good individuals in it. I'm not condemning everyone in that organization by any means. But the organization itself, I no longer respect and I no longer endorse. In my opinion, it's no longer worthy of your respect or your support. Richard Harvey still has a Jews for Jesus website. He should be removed from their council. Susan Perlman should resign. 
the executive director should resign and their board should demand it be done, then I will reconsider and revisit Jews for Jesus. But in the face of anti-Semitism, of this kind of Jew hatred, of the utter destruction of our witness and testimony for Yeshua to the Jewish community, for the sake of their theocratic politics and their fundraising and their whatever else it is, no thank you. Jews for Jesus is not the same organization. It is a different organization with the same name. I wish this wasn't true, but it is. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you for listening. God bless. speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kendall. Kendall. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed for the faithful church. The rapture will not happen. Will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet how the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.